Hi, and welcome to another story. And today we have part four of Ned and the Chocolate Cheats by Mark Jarvis, continuing from chapter seven, Buried. After we'd eaten our delicious lunch, Nula said that she had some things that she had to do that afternoon. Why didn't we go and explore the local area? Today was Sunday and Columbia Road Flower Market was just close. We weren't very far from Brick Lane, which would also be very busy today. There will be lots of street food vendors and so there will be great smells and sights. We made our way past the little park and into the busy throng of the bustling flower market. The street was closed off to traffic and was packed with people and flower stalls. The market traders were calling out to attract customers. Two bunches for a pound! Now you won't find a better deal better than that! It was difficult to walk in between all the people's legs and I was glad that Jeff put my lead on or else we would quickly have become separated. The smell of all the wonderful flowers was really strong, but even so I managed to sniff out a few other dogs. I spotted another Jack Russell sitting in a quiet spot beside one of the flower stalls whilst his person bought some fresh flowers. All right, son, he greeted me as I edged past. Yes, thanks, I replied. It's really busy and crowded today, isn't it? Oh, yeah, the Jack Russell agreed. It's like this when there's a market on, innit? Keep a close eye on your person now. You don't want to get lost. I will, thanks. Bye, I said cheerfully. We moved on through the crowd and out to the end of the road, where it was a little quieter. Now, my sister said that we should just go through here. Oh, wait, I think the spy phone is ringing. Jeff reached into his pocket inside his jacket and sp pulled out the spy phone. Oh, no, it's my other phone. He shoved it back again and pulled out his own device. Hello, Gizmo, he exclaimed as he swiped across the slider on the screen to answer the video call. Bend down a bit, I called up to him. I want to speak to her too. My person crouched down so that we could both see the screen. Gizmo's fluffy face came into view. I could see from the picture that she was sitting at a table in a coffee shop. Hey dudes, she greeted us. How's it hanging? Yes, we're good, thanks, I answered before Jeff could get a word in. I'm glad you phoned because I've got something quite extraordinary to tell you. As we sat there on the pavement, I sat my person crouched. I quickly told Gizmo all that had happened in Jesus Green that morning. Whoa, that's so cool, said Gizmo. You guys are like real spies or something. And you as well, Gizmo, I said. The man behind the newspaper said that we should keep in contact with you, as you are great at research. Oh, that is so way cool, Gizmo replied. Just tell me, what you want me to do, dudes? Nothing yet, Jeff said. He moved himself back a little from the edge of the pavement, as someone came past with another large trolley full of flowers. I'm not even sure what we're supposed to be doing, I exclaimed. The man behind the newspaper said that we should just stay alert. Well, I'm here if you need me, dudes. I'll track you as you move around using the cool app called Poodle Maps. Stay in touch. With that, Gizmo rang off and Jeff stuffed the phone back into his jeans pocket. Get your phone out again, I said. You can use the Maps app so that we don't get lost. Good idea, Jeff replied. I'd forgotten all about that. OK, the map says that Brick Lane is uh, this way. I got up onto my feet, had a quick shake and a wee against the wall, just so that people would know I'd been there, and followed along on the pavement. The streets began to get busier again, and the smells of different types of cooking became stronger and stronger. As we walked into the sea of people's legs, I caught amazing yummy aromas, both from the street vendors and from the bits of food and litter that had fallen onto the floor. I loved all the busyness. These streets always made me feel that something exciting was about to happen. This is Brick Lane here, Jeff said. Look at the old cobbles and the shop fronts. Imagine one of these barber shops. Could be Sweeney Todd's barbers. We could be made into pies, he said in a pretend scary voice. Oh, that sounds mysterious. I'll have to find out about that when we get home. I pulled towards another smell that I wanted to explore. I didn't feel that comfortably, com comfortingly familiar tug on my collar of the lead that kept us close together. I looked back around towards my person. My lead wasn't attached anymore. It was just lying limply on the cobbled street. It had been cut about 50 centimetres along from where it joined my collar. There was no sign of Jeff on the end of it. In a fraction of a second, all the sights, smells and sounds disappeared to be replaced by the musty smell of a thick, heavy sack. Chapter 8. Coal Hole The sack had been pulled over my head and I felt myself being scooped up into it and carried into the air. There was a bump against my side as I was slung onto somebody's back. I was jogged about quickly. We were moving. There were muffled voices and the slam of a heavy door. It all happened so quickly, I hadn't time to think about what to do, but after more jostling, I was dropped down onto a hard surface. Jeff's words about being made into pie suddenly came back to me as the top of the sack went limp. There was another slam on the door and everything was still. I carefully poked my head up out of the sack and looked around. I remember that when I was a pup, my parents told me that if I ever felt unsure of a situation, the first thing I should do was to stay still and find out as much information as possible before doing anything. It was dark. I could see nothing. As my nose came clear of the rough material, I started sniffing. 
I could smell a number of things. First, the room I was in had a damp scent, like old fireplaces. It had a coal aroma, a bit like the chimneys of our old terrace house at home. I could also sniff our faint cooking smells and the distinctive pong of people and dogs. What could I hear? Well, nothing clearly, but I was definitely aware of the sound of voices. I could not make out the words that they were, they were using, but only sense the murmur of conversation. I carefully shook off the sack and stepped out on to stand on the stone floor. It had a cold, gritty feel. Suddenly I spun around to face a blinding white light as the heavy door was swung open again. Something tall and large was shoved in by my unseen, by unseen hands and the door was slammed shut. The big sack hit the floor and with a large thud and I heard a loud voice that I recognised. Oh, flipping heck, it grumbled loudly. It was the unmistakable voice of my person. Hang on, keep still a minute, I said. I'll help you out. I grabbed at the sack and wrestled with it until I had pulled it clear of Jeff's head. Wow, it's dark in here, he exclaimed. I can't see a thing. Where are we, Ned? What just happened? As for where we are, I have no more idea than you have, but I think it's quite clear that we've been kidnapped. I still think that they are quite close by because I can hear voices. Hey, haven't you got a torch on your phone? Yes, I have, Jeff confirmed, but it was snatched from my hand before they pulled the sack over my head. I was using poodle maps, remember? What about the other phone, the spy one? Did they take that? You are brilliant, Ned. I'd forgotten all about that one. Jeff reached inside his jacket once again and pulled out the phone that we had been given that morning. He flicked on the torch and at last we could see that we were shut in an old empty cellar. It was grubby and dirty with black dust. OK, I said. You can phone for help now. Good plan, Ned. But no, I can't. There is no signal down here. Well, what's that up there in the corner? Shine your torch up there. In the torchlight, we could see it was a small square metal grate. Lift me up there, will you? I asked. That's where I think the conversation I can hear is coming from. Hold me near the grate so that I can hear properly. I could indeed hear better, and what I heard almost made me wish I'd stayed on the ground. One voice, a deep growl with a strong Cockney accent, said, Well, boss, what do we do now? We got them, like you said, and they're safe in the old coal cellar. See, si, yes, said a high, posh, vo high, posh sort of voice. It had the rhythm of an Italian accent. Now will you get to one of your humans to let me and put put it down on top of the table so that I can talk to you all. That must have been the dog that I could smell. It sounded like he might be in charge. He continued, the instructions that I was given were to eliminate them as soon as possible. Those two, they uh, know it too much already. That stupid dog who raided one of the news agents in Plymouth has given away too much of our information. It's a shame that they're eating all that chocolate doesn't kill him. We've sent them a warning with the underpants, so now it is only fair that we have the permanent solution. How are we going to do them in, boss? said another voice. Just tell me, and I'll do it now. Now, wait just a minute, the Italian voice boss said firmly. The great Garbo wants us to leave no trace that we are here, and no clues that we are in any way connected to the elimination of those two. We are going to fill up the cellar with a liquid concrete and bury them forever. <laughs> I'm so wicked. The other voices also laughed wickedly. But boss, how are we going to get the concrete into the cellar? It's a good thing that I am the one in charge, isn't it? The voice of the boss said. We can, uh, can uh, think humans every time. They are in a coal cellar, no? There is a trap door and a chute that leads down from the street where the coal delivery used to be poured in. The chute is covered in, up by a piece of a tin board in the cellar, but the weight of the concrete will break it too. The, uncellar, the, the cellar will fill and they will be doomed, <laughs> the voice chortled. Boss, how do you know that these instructions are really from Great Grabber and not from someone pretending? Because, stupido, the Italian voice said impatiently, they are using the secret sign at the end of the letter, the sign of the three dog biscuits. That proves it is a genuine instruction. <laughs> All the other voices said. When are we doing it, boss? The first deep voice growled. In exactly three hours. The concrete lorry will make its delivery. This gives us enough time to get a taxi to the airport. I can fly to Hong Kong in time to meet one of the great Garba's most trusted associates. And then I can tell him how marvellously efficient and evil we have all been. <laughs> in the torchlight, Jeff and I looked at each other, first with shock and horror, but then both with a slow smile creeping onto our expressions. We were both realising how we were going to escape. Finding the thin board that blocked the old coal chute was dif wasn't difficult. Now that we knew it was there, simply knocking on the wall and listening to the different sounds the knocks made soon showed us where the board was. 
The hard, solid thud of the brick wall changed to a hollow wooden sound and showed us that the square board was on the wall right in front of us. The reason that we couldn't see it was because of the darkness of the room, combined with the general dirtiness and dustiness of the walls. In the light of the phone torch, we could see that it was about the size of a small window. Although finding the wooden board was easy, the next problem, the one of taking the board down, was rather difficult. The board was attached to the wall at each corner by screws. They were screws that were driven, driven in tightly and needed a screwdriver to remove them. We didn't have a screwdriver. I sat down on the floor in the darkness and thought hard. There must be a solution. Jeff's only solution was to shout in annoyance and stamp his foot in frustration. Grrr, he shouted. So near yet so far. Hang on, let me think, I replied. I scratched at my collar with my hind foot, and in doing so, the answer came to me. That's it, I shouted. My collar medallion. When I scratched, I had heard my metal collar medallion jangle in the quiet of the room. The medallion was bone-shaped and attached to the collar by a clip in the middle. My name and Jeff's mobile number were written on it, just in case something happened to me. Unclip my collar medallion, I ordered. Use the end of the bone as a screwdriver. It's made of very hard metal and should work perfectly. Brilliant, Jeff exclaimed. I'm on it. I stood on my back legs with my front paw against him so that he could easily reach my collar. Jeff quickly unclipped the medallion and examined the shape of the metal bone in the torchlight. It should fit perfectly, he declared, and he turned to the wall and started unscrewing the screws with our makeshift screwdriver. It took him quite a long time as each screw was firmly screwed in. Whilst he worked, I stood t still and thought. I quickly came to a decision. Listen, I said. As soon as we've escaped from this cellar, we need to jump in a taxi and go to your sister's house to get the money and passports. Oh, he replied through clenched teeth as he struggled with the screws. Why's that? Do you fancy a nice relaxing beach holiday after this experience? Well, not exactly a beach holiday, but a trip to Hong Kong instead. Ever been? I asked. Of course not, he replied, still unscrewing. You know, I've never really been anywhere. I think the man behind the newspaper would want us to go. If we've got to find out more about who's behind these chocolate robberies, then we've got to be at that meeting with Gabba's trusted associate. In fact, we should try to be on the same flight as that boss dog who is meeting them. Jeff stopped unscrewing for a moment. He looked at me in the light of the torch he held in his other hand. You're mad. But that's why I love you so much. What have we got to lose? After all, it's all paid for by MI5. He turned back to the unscrewing. Nearly there, he puffed. Ah, there. With the last screw no longer holding the board in place, it slid down to the floor of the cellar, settling with a clatter and a cloud of dust. Sunlight and sound flooded in, and we both shielded our eyes, which had previously become adjusted to the dark. We stood and looked up to the chute to the street above. The hole was plenty big enough for us to be able to get up it. It sloped steeply up towards the outside world, as the top appeared to be an old iron grating that we could see people's feet walking over. There is nothing stopping me just pushing the grating up, it doesn't look like it's fixed at all, remarked Jeff. I'll go up and push the grate, and then I can lean down and pull you up. Great, go for it, I said. Jeff jumped up a little onto the opening. At the same time, he pushed on both sides of the chute which it, with his hands. He brought his knee up to the chute and was able to wedge himself. He reached up and pushed up against the grate. At first it remained stuck, and, felt a, he, and I felt a lurch in my tummy as I thought that our escape plan wasn't going to work. Suddenly the grate gave way with a clatter and flipped over onto the street above. Jeff gripped the edge of the hole and pulled himself out. Then he lay down again on the pavement and reached down into the chute. I jumped up as high as I could, and grabbing hold of my front paws, Jeff was quickly able to help me up to street level. I shook myself, whilst he carefully replaced the grate. Well, now we've got a chute. Ha, <laughs> shoot, get it? I said, pleased with my little shoot, shoot joke. That was rubbish, said Jeff. Let's just get a taxi, quickly. We can pay the driver and some of the money with some of the money left at Nula's house. We soon hailed a black cab, and it didn't take long to get back. The driver let me out to get some of the money that we had been given. Jeff unlocked the door and I went in, stood on my hind legs and grabbed some of the money from the table. I dashed back out to pay the driver, and then we both got safely into the house. For now, at least, we could shut the yellow door on the danger that was outside. I, wonder if I wondered if our kidnap was covered by the Dangerous Dogs Act. And that is where we will leave part four of Ned and the Chocolate Cheats by Mark Jarvis. I will be back soon with the next part of this fantastic story. Lots more coming your way as well. Lots of videos, lots of stories, and lots of other things as well. So if you'd like to uh, subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for your support, guys. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.